Well, it's a wonderful Sunday evening. I'm so glad to have you joining with us on Front Range Online tonight. I'm thankful for the opportunity to come to you uh, in this format, and so I pray that the Lord will speak to your heart tonight. Gather who you've got with you, and let's open our Bibles in just a moment. We're going to go to two places. The first we're going to go to is 1 Kings chapter 22, and then I'll direct you from there in just a moment. But 1 Kings chapter 22, we are uh, enjoying looking at pictures of courage throughout the Old Testament. Our, our uh, theme for the year has been on uh, courageous, being a courageous Christian, and it certainly is a day and age that requires courage from God's people. And so tonight we want to take a look at um, a man we looked at some last week, but we're going to look at more of the story this week that I think has some really powerful lessons for all of us when it comes to being a courageous Christian. I want to thank all of those of you who faithfully were there this morning. It was a wonderful service today. We took some time in our morning service to pray for our young people. I talked to them just a little while ago, and they were already um, well over halfway there and, and um, um, looking forward to a week of camp. And so I really pray for this group. We had 72 that went to camp uh, this summer, and so we're praying that God will do a, a great work in all of their lives and their hearts. And I'm going to pray that God will do a work in your home. If you sent young people to camp, I'm praying that God will do a work in your heart and in your home so that when they come back, the environment and the atmosphere of your home will be conducive to what God has done in their heart while they're at camp. And make that a focus for you this week while they're away. And really pray and examine your own heart that God would do what he needs to do in you to further the work that he's doing in them. And I know that God will use all of us to raise up a generation of young people that can be uh, able to face this world courageously. We're looking tonight at 1 Kings 22, 1 King, 1 Kings 22, and I, I, this is a wonderful story in the Bible. Uh, I had several of you who reached out and said some things about last week uh, that you hadn't really heard this story. And uh, that was uh, encouraging to my heart that we were getting into things in the Bible that would be um, helpful and eye-opening and, and cause us to want to dig more into the Scripture. Many Christians have uh, ignored things in the Old Testament thinking that there's a disparity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. I've heard many people today who've, who've cast a lot of shadow of doubt on the Bible because they think that the God of the Old Testament is not the same God of the New Testament. And that couldn't be any further from the truth. Listen, Jehovah in the Old Testament is Jesus in the New Testament. And if you want to know God, you study the life of Christ. Obviously, you can see God in the Lord Jesus Christ. But uh, what you need to remember is that what happened in the Old Testament were examples and were lessons for us in the New Testament. And the, the Old Testament... Is, is designed to give us an understanding of the nature of God, the true holiness of God, and his plan for redemption in the world. And through Jesus Christ, we, we see that all come into fruition. You'll never understand the Old Testament fully without the New Testament, of course, but you'll also miss so much in the New Testament if you don't have an understanding of the Old Testament. And so I would encourage you to read it, to study it, and to let God speak to your heart through that. But let's look at 1 Kings chapter 22. And this is the story of Jehoshaphat and Ahab as they partner together to go fight the Syrians to take Ramoth in Gilead back for Israel. Now, remember, Israel and Judah have been a divided kingdom. The 10 tribes of the north ruled by Ahab uh, they, they have been at war with Syria, but there's been three years of peace. Jehoshaphat rules the king, the kingdom of the south, and uh, the southern kingdom, or Judah, the two tribes of Israel there. And he is one of eight kings of Judah that were good and godly kings. He's only one of three kings that was compared to David. Jehoshaphat was a good man. 
His, his father was Asa. And even though Asa didn't worship idols, uh, Asa didn't tear down the groves. He didn't deal with the idolatry in Judah. But when Jehoshaphat came in, he did that. And uh, Jehoshaphat was a king that was really, truly seeking God. But he made some very critical mistakes that I think all of us can learn from as we pursue what it means to have good courage and godly courage in an ungodly world. Look at chapter 22 of 1 Kings. This is when Jehoshaphat agrees to go into this battle of this alliance with Ahab. And he says, I'll do it. My armies are at your disposal and so forth. And then he says in verse number five, Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, and this is after he already agreed to go into this alliance. He says in verse five, inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. Now there's a reason why Jehoshaphat said, yes, we'll go. But then he pivots and says, but we better inquire of God. Well, that should have been first, but he didn't do that first. And there's a reason why he's saying this, and it's because in the back of his mind, in his, in his heart of hearts, he knows that he should not be going into this alliance with Ahab, but he does it anyway. And so they bring in the 400 prophets Ahab has hired, and they give him a good word and tell Ahab, go into battle, everything's going to be fine, God's going to give Ramoth into your hand. But then Jehoshaphat says, yeah, but is there another prophet here that we might inquire of the Lord to see what the Lord says. And Ahab says, yeah, there's one. Let's look at it here. Look at your Bible. He says, uh, he says down in verse number, um, verse number of 14 or verse number 12, rather, I'm sorry. He says, um, he says, and all the prophets prophesied saying, go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper for the Lord shall deliver it to the, into the king's hand. And the messenger that was gone to call Micah spake unto him, saying, Behold now, the words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of them, and speak that which is good. And Micah said, As the Lord liveth, and what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. So he came to the king, and the king said unto him, Micah, shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And he said, Go and prosper. For the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? And then he goes into the vision that he had that Ahab would die. And Ahab, you remember, has him put into jail. Micah is imprisoned on a ration of bread and water, and he's put in that prison until Ahab comes back from battle. But Micah knows he's not coming back from the battle. You're going to be killed in this war, or I'm not a true prophet of God. And we saw last week that Micah had a relationship with God, and that relationship with God caused him to speak the truth. He saw a king of higher authority and greater power and of more reverence and holiness than Ahab. And that was Jehovah God. He had been with the king in his throne room and he had seen the Lord. And Micah, because of the fear of God, was willing to tell the truth. And I wanna tell you that our, our courage and our truth telling in this world today is going to come in direct um, adherence to our relationship with God. When you begin to drift from God, you'll drift from the truth. You begin to drift away from the Lord and you will, you will lose your courage to face the adversities of this world. Now, I want you to look over, if you will, at 2 Chronicles and I want you to look at chapter 18. 2 Chronicles chapter 18. This is another time where the story is retold in the Bible of, Je of Jehoshaphat and his uh, um, going into this allegiance with Ahab. And it retells the whole story. And But I want to call your attention to a few things if you'll look with me in verse 28. In verse 28 of 2 Chronicles 18, the Bible says, So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Israel is Ahab, and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead, and the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and will go to the battle, but put thou on my robe, on thy robe. So the king of Israel disguised himself 
and they went into the battle. Now the king of Syria had commanded the captains of the chariots that were with him, saying, Fight ye not with small or great, save only the king of Israel. And it came to pass when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat that they said, It is the king of Israel. Therefore they compassed him about to fight. But Jehoshaphat cried out, and the Lord helped him, and God moved them to depart from him. So understand this. They're going to go into the battle now. Ahab says, I'm going to put on disguise. I'm going as a common man. I'm going to go in perhaps as a soldier. And he says to Jehoshaphat, but you put on your kingly robes. And so Jehoshaphat does. Now the king of Syria had already determined, I'm going to go kill Ahab. I don't care about this war. I'm not trying to fight a battle. I'm going to go kill Ahab. Ahab's the problem. So he commands all of his captains and all of his generals, you only, don't you go into battle with everybody else. You just go find the king and you kill him. So when they came out to battle and they saw Jehoshaphat there in his kingly robes, they all came after him and surrounded him. And Jehoshaphat realized what was going on and he cries out to God. And God supernaturally moved the hearts of these captains and these soldiers away from Jehoshaphat. And notice what happened in verse 32. For it came to pass that when the captains of the chariots perceived that it was not the king of Israel, they turned back again from pursuing him. And a certain man drew a bow at a venture and smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. Therefore he said to his chariot man, turn thine hand that thou mayest carry me out of the host for I am wounded and the battle increased that day. Howbeit the king of Israel stayed himself up in his chariot against the Syrians until the evening. And about the time of the sun going down, he died. Now here's very quickly the story. I wanna give you some really practical points tonight that I think will help all of us as we face these same kind of decisions in our, in our kind of world today. But Jehoshaphat puts on these kingly garments He's surrounded by these people. He cries out to God for help. God moves the people away from him and they realize it's not him and they, they move away and go into the battle and at a chance, one unnamed man of the Syrian army draws a bow back and shoots it into the air and that bow directed by God's hand goes into the chariot of Ahab, goes through a joint in his armor and smites him. Ahab tells his driver, turn around, get me out of the battle, get, get out of this battle. And he goes up, parks on the hill, and Ahab stays there and watches this battle and until the going down of the sun and his life went out of him and he bled to death in the chariot. You'll find later that when they came to the town that as they washed out the chariot of Ahab's blood, the dogs licked the blood. Ahab died a horrific death, a death not of chance, but a death at the hand of God. He was the most wicked king Israel had, and he was a king that was a liar, a deceiver. He was an idolater. He was a man who was covetous. He was a coward. He's the one that couldn't do anything about Naboth's vineyard. He wanted the vineyard, and so his wife had to go in and kill Naboth to get the vineyard to Ahab. He was just, he was just not the man that you would ever want to associate with, and yet we find Jehoshaphat doing just that. And this is the story here. Micah had the courage of the, of the prophets, one of 400, to stand in that room and say to the king, if you go, you're gonna die. He was slapped in the face for it. He was mocked by the 400 prophets. He was put into prison. Uh, he was treated horribly, and I don't know uh, how long that guy had to stay in that jail simply because Ahab never came back from battle. But Micah showed undaunting courage in the face of overwhelming adversity. But Ahab knew he was right in his heart of hearts. Jehoshaphat knew he was right in his heart of hearts, and yet they still go along with this plan and go to battle that ultimately cost Ahab his life. And I wanna tell you that this is a story of compromise in Jehoshaphat's life. 
Jehoshaphat was a man who was a good man. He was a godly man. He had been pursuing the Lord. He had many accolades from God. But he got himself in a situation with Ahab that led to compromise upon compromise upon compromise that ultimately led, get this, it led to nearly the full eradication of the line of David. Do you remember Athaliah? This was Ahab's daughter that Jehoshaphat had this arranged marriage. One of Jehoshaphat's sons married Athaliah. <coughs> Athaliah had him killed and all of the line began to kill all the line of David. Thank God for one lady who hid one baby away and the lineage was salvaged. But listen, this is the cost. All those males in the line of David, all of those men lost their lives because of this compromise. And I want you to see the courage tonight of a prophet named Jehu as he confronts Jehoshaphat. And we're gonna look at Jehoshaphat's compromise in just a moment, but watch this. Chapter 19 of 2 Chronicles, verse one. And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace. Ahab's dead. Jehoshaphat returns in peace. And Jehu, the son of Hanai, the seer, went out to meet him and said to the king, Jehoshaphat, now notice this question. Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is the wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Nevertheless, he says, there are good things found in thee, in that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land and hast prepared thine heart to seek God. Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem. Jehu confronts him when he comes back and he said, should you help those who hate God? Should you really give help to those and love to those who are working against God and have a heart that hates God? I mean, what are you doing? What are you doing? This was the compromise of Jehoshaphat. Where did it all start? It started when Jehoshaphat made a, a marriage with one of his sons and one of the daughters of Ahab. Later, Ahab throws a great feast in Samaria. Jehoshaphat goes up there. Ahab has slaughtered a good number of animals. He's prepared this massive feast. And Jehoshaphat is sitting at Ahab's table, eating Ahab's food, being entertained by all of Ahab's court, and at that meal is when Ahab asks Jehoshaphat about going with him to capture Ramoth Gilead. And Jehoshaphat couldn't say no. In that setting, he's got family ties now. He's been treated so well by this king, Ahab, and he's sitting in this prominent place at this table, eating this feast, and he says, yeah, I'll go with you. He didn't have the courage to say no. He didn't put himself in a place of separation, a place of distinction that he could have the courage and the boldness to tell him no. Now, can I tell you tonight that there are some great lessons for us as believers? Let me give you just a couple. Number one, Number one, we are told clearly in the Bible, don't love the world. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And he said all these things pass away. But those that do the will of the Father live forever. Now listen to me. This is what John was teaching us. John was saying, do not love the world. Jehoshaphat was not satisfied with the things that God had given him. Jehoshaphat, God had prospered him. He had done some wonderful things. In that, Jehoshaphat disobeyed the Lord. And he loved those that hated God. Oh, what a terrible thing 
that we find in this passage of scripture that Jehoshaphat joins in this league with Ahab, one who fully hated God. And Jehu calls it out in verse number in verse number two of chapter 19. He says, shouldest thou help the ungodly? I mean, listen, it's not even close. Ahab is not a man that's on the fence. Ahab is fully committed to all that is against God. He is a man who hates God. He says there, should you love them that hate the Lord? And, and this is a warning to all of us as Christians. Uh, we, we, we hear so much about love today and we hear so much about uh, kindness and we hear so much about, well, we, we've got to be loving and we've got to <clears throat> uh, hate the sin and love the sinner and all that's so true. But listen to me, listen to me. We are to speak the truth in love. But there is a point that we as believers, and it's not a popular position to take in the world today, but there is a position that we have to take, a point that we believers come to where we have to hate the things that God hates. We have to draw the lines that God draws, and we have to, we have to walk in that light that God has given us. And we have to be understanding that there is evil in the world and there are those who have set their hearts fully in them to do evil. Listen, there are people today who are doing everything they can in their power to pervert our young people, to push their, their, their laws and their lifestyles on the rest of us. And they, listen, they don't want to just be left alone. They don't want to even be accepted. They don't want us to just sit back and say, fine, do whatever you want to do. Just leave us alone. Oh, no, no, that's not good enough. They want us to, to affirm. They want us to conform. They want us to, to validate what they're doing. And this is what, this is what Ahab did. He, he put the spread on. He put the feast out. He sat down with Jehoshaphat and he said, Jehoshaphat, I've got a lot to offer you. And, and friend, this is where Jehoshaphat lost the battle because he fell in love with the world. He loved the world. Now, you got to remember, there are three worlds in the Bible. There's the world that God made. It's a beautiful world of creation, the natural world that God made that's wonderful. There's the world that God loves. God so loved the world. That's me. That's you. That's all the people on this planet. God loves them. And we can love the world that God made. And we can love the world that, that uh, God loves. But friend, there is a world that hates God. There is a system today under the control of its own Ahab, Satan, its king, its little G God of this world. And it is bent on defying and living in total rebellion to God. That's exactly what Ahab did. And Jehoshaphat loved that world. He joined into it for a business venture. This was something that Jehoshaphat was doing because of his family ties, because of the, the commerce that would come from it, he allowed himself to be drawn in to love this present world. That's a warning to us. Do not love the world. You better be very careful about falling in love with this world. Number two, don't make partnerships with unbelievers. Don't make partnerships with unbelievers. The Bible tells us clearly in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14 that we are not to have, uh, be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath light with darkness? What concord hath God with Belial? There's, you, can't, you can't put light and dark together. You can't put God and Satan together. You can't do that. And so he warns us about these partnerships with unbelievers. This is what Jehoshaphat did. He got under the same yoke with Ahab. He got into a partnership with him. Now listen, we're gonna all have to do business in this world. We all have to live in this world. We have to, we have to be kind with others. We have to do business with others, but that's not the point. The point is getting into yokes and and togetherness of in the same work and trying to pull the same direction and being like a yoke of oxen that are going to plow this field. You're put together. Your necks are in this thing together. And uh, what he's talking about are types of partnerships like in our dating life, in our marriage life, in, in going into business partnerships with unbelievers. Christian, you better be very careful with that. In fact, God God doesn't desire that. He He's against us going into these kind of relationships and partnerships with unbelievers. Why? 
Why is that? Is it because God just uh, uh, hates those people? Listen to me, listen to me. Unbelievers have a different value system. They value things differently than a believer does. They have, they have a different commitment to, to things in life than what a believer should. They have, um, they have different directions that they're going than a believer should be going. Now, a Christian can have the wrong direction. A Christian can have wrong commitments. A Christian can have wrong values. A Christian can do all those things wrongfully. But if they do that, they're going in opposition to God. And what God's warning us here is, if you want to go the right direction, don't yoke up with someone who doesn't. If you value the right things, don't yoke up with someone who doesn't. Because eventually, those things are going to come to a serious point of contention. You're going to get into a system of values that you can't go along with. You're going to get into a, a battle of commitments and where your heart's going to be. So God warns us about these partnerships. Let me tell you, these partnerships will challenge your faithfulness to God. James tells it this way in James chapter four and verse four. He said, what? Know you not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? When you join in to a partnership and a league with those that hate God, you have essentially become the enemy of God. And this is, this is Jehoshaphat's great problem. Jehoshaphat was not content with what God gave him. So he partners with Ahab, a man who hates God, thinking that he's going to come away from this blessed. But this is the third lesson that we learn from Jehoshaphat's life. Don't think the world will be true to you. Don't think that the world will be true to you. So Ahab wines and dines Jehoshaphat. He gets him to listen to the 400 prophets and not pay any attention to Micah. He finally gets him to agree to go into this battle. Jehoshaphat, listen, you can tell by the whole context of this story, the undertone of this story, Jehoshaphat knows that what he's doing is not right. And then they get to the battle and Ahab has the gall and the audacity to say to him, look, you put on your kingly clothes and I'm going to wear common clothes. I'm just going to wear, I'm going to blend in, you stand out. Ahab wasn't a friend to Jehoshaphat. Ahab knew that the Syrians were going to come after Jehoshaphat. Ahab was not true to him. Listen, the world, it'll promise you everything. It'll party with you, just like Ahab did with Jehoshaphat. It'll spread the feast. It'll hang out. It'll wine you. It'll dine you. It'll, it'll treat you well for a time. The world will give you honor and acceptance, just like Ahab did with Jehoshaphat. Oh, man, Jehoshaphat rolled out the, was, was rolled out the red carpet. He came into this, this place uh, high and, and, uh, and uh, handsome, and he came in with all kinds of acceptance. And not only that... Um, he was enticed with all kinds of commitments. Uh, there were promises made that Ahab was going to do for Jehoshaphat that Ahab had no intention of doing. And I've seen this so many times. In my years of ministry, I've seen, and it's happened to me, it looks as though this thing is so shiny and so wonderful and so good, and then you pursue it and you find out there's a hook in it. The thing that was shiny was a lure, and now I'm entangled. It's a terrible thing. It's happened more times in my life than I, than I would love to admit. And I've watched people's lives ruined and wrecked over and over and over and over again because the world promised one thing but delivered another. It promised pleasure but brought pain. It promised financial freedom but brought bondage. Friend, you can't, you can't violate the laws of God and expect to succeed. If you obey the Lord, you'll find true success and true prosperity. Jehoshaphat was a fool to think that Ahab would treat him right. And you and I are fools when we think that the devil is gonna be fair with us, that the world is gonna treat us right. Look, you simply obey God. You obey God. You leave all the consequences to him. You let God deal with all the things that come from the fallout of your obedience. 
and you let God prosper you. Jehoshaphat brought a great curse into his family. And there were many who paid the price for his sin. It's a sad story of compromise because oftentimes when you make these compromises, it's others who pay the price. Hezekiah made compromises that others paid the price for. Uh, back in the story of the book of Ruth, uh, there was compromises made. And who paid the price? Those kids, those widows. Uh, Naomi paid the price. Ruth paid a price. Malon and Killian paid the price. Uh, others pay the price for our compromise. And can I tell you tonight that there needs to be some courage. When you're standing alone, be like Micah. Be willing in the face of the peer pressure of 400 to still stand for what's right. Don't capitulate to those who are whining and dining and giving what you think is a honor and uh, accolades to you. No, no, listen, you stay true to God. You stay faithful to his word and God will bless you for that. It takes courage in those kind of circumstances. Jehoshaphat lacked it. And I want to say, should we, should we help the ungodly? Should we love those that hate God? And quite frankly, the answer is no. Let's stand for the Lord. Let's live for the Lord. And God will bless you for that. In every circumstance, God will bless you for that. Obey God and leave all those consequences to him. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to learn from the story of Jehoshaphat tonight. Help us to stand like Jehu and like Micah and these who had great courage in the face of great adversity. Lord, bless your people with power and might and strength and resolve to just simply obey. Lord, we don't have to go out and attack. We just stand. And I pray that we would find the courage to do that. Lord, bless our young people. Is there a way this week? Continue to give protection. I pray that you'll speak to their hearts in every session of camp and every devotion and every aspect of it. Do a work in them. And Lord, prepare us as they come home to be what we ought to be, to help them to be all that you desire them to be. In Jesus' name.